So this is the 10th chapter of Master in Shiny. It is called Dynamic UI. And, and the goal for this chapter is to change or update the user interface. Now, not via the UI that we are used to in the code, but now via the server function. Uh, we will see three mains to do that. The first will be to update the parameters of already created inputs. The second will be to hide or show content. Uh, we are making use of the tab set panel function. And the last one will be a little bit more general. Uh, that is using the UI output and the render UI functions. So with respect to the first way, we'll be looking at how to update inputs. Uh, we have already been working with many of those, for example, numeric inputs, select inputs, and every one of them com comes paired with some update function. Uh, over here, let's take a look, at, a look at one example of those. Let's see. In this application, let me run it first and then take a look at the code. Uh, yes, we have some layer input. Minimum zero, maximum three, but as I change these values, the, the minimum and maximum for the slider are also changing. We can do that uh, via the following. For example, for this layer input with identifier n, it comes paired with the update slider input function whose parameters are the ID of the input that you want to change and the new values, the new parameters that we are going to set. In this case, we are changing the minimum via this input over here. And we're changing also, updating this layer input, its maximum via this other value that the user can select. So this is the function in this case for the UI update. Uh, so a couple of, of cases where we, it can, it can come up that why would we need to update the user interface? And the author mentions, for example, to reset the input parameters. Uh, that is the case where you have a, a bunch of inputs and maybe you need to overwrite everything. And the way to do that is, as we can see in this example, let me run the app. Let's see. We have three inputs, uh, even now that I change these values, uh, they were by default zero, but now as I click on the reset button, they come back to their initial value. Uh, in this case, it's similar. We are working with the slider input, so we are using the update, update the slider input to change its parameters. And we are doing that as we click on the reset button, this one over here. We are simply changing the value to the one that has been established in the initial case. Okay. Uh, another example that I mentioned is to update a description of some button section. Uh, that would be the case of changing the label of some action button. Sorry, sorry. Did you recreate? Okay, go on, sorry. Go on. Uh, sorry, if I recreated what? Uh, I was thinking maybe we created the because you just have the examples, so I was trying to check if we created something, but no, no, no order. Just go on. Okay. Go on, go on. Uh, okay, so we are looking at the third example to change the label of a button. So as I run this up, let wait, let's see. Okay. Uh, I changed this numeric value, and now we can see that the label of the button is also, is also changing with respect to that value. In that case, we are not we are not changing the minimum maximum of the value of this uh, param of this input parameter, but we're simply taking the action button, use the update action button function, and change the label parameter that is this text being displayed. So now other other example where we may, where we may be using this is the hierarchical select boxes. And uh, those are 
uh, both boxes that select boxes that depend on one another. So you make a choose, you make a choice in one, and then that influences the possible choices that you can make in the next select box. And to take a look at that, we can see the fourth example. If we, if we will be working with some data set that the author of us shared, and it's available in table. So let's see, let's first run it and then take a look at the code. Uh, we have some first select box. These are some territories related to this data set, this data set sales. Okay. So I, I select some territory and then such selections make a change, makes, sorry, produces a change in the available choices in this customer yes. select box. So now I click in another, uh, I click, I set another choice for that select box. And now these two choices over here and over here, they produce a change in the choices for this new, sorry, for this latest select box. And now we have those and I can change it. And, and really what, what, what we are looking at over in this table, it's simply uh, that the data, the sales data sample, but being filtered by via these parameters, this value for territory, this value for customer, and this value for order numbers. Uh, and simply the way to do that is first you load the data, and now that we have our selected inputs, you can take a look over here that for this second uh, and last uh, select inputs, they don't have choices set uh, in the beginning because they are going to depend in the previous select input. In this case, this one depends on this one, and this last one depends on the previous two. So basically the idea is that you pick some territory that if you make a selection over here, and then via such selection, uh, you filter your data set, that is this territory reactive value. And now from that uh, filter data set, you can uh, now obtain which of the unique values for the filter data sets, customer name attribute. Uh, and simply via those unique values for those unique choices, now you can update the second input, the select input with now setting those choices, those unique values. And, and it's similar for the third. You now filter a couple more your your data set, and now you change also its choices uh, with the unique values for this attribute, but now for the uh, re-filtered data set, filtered by territory and filtered by customer. So the main idea is this function. You can also change the choices. I'll be trying to to go pretty fast because there is quite a lot of, con of content in this chapter, but I still uh, I feel free to to stop me at any time if there if something isn't clear. But I didn't get that part. That is I didn't get what you said then. You, you didn't what? I didn't hear you well. You said something, but I didn't hear you. Can you come again? Okay, let's take a look. You said I can. Insert. Okay, go on, go on. Sorry, go on. Yes. Okay. We're over here. Preceding okay. reactive inputs. Uh, so th there is a problem uh, uh, via what we did previously, this hierarchic, hierarchical selection. And there is a, if we do that, some flickering can appear in the app due to, for a brief, for a brief of time, in rating some invalid invalid input parameters. Uh, so take a look at that. Let's check example five. Uh, let's see. Now we are choosing two possible data sets, the data set pressure or the data set carbs. And now, uh, let's see, I will, I will first, I have cars now. I can change a, a column of cars. Or, or here we're simply displaying the attributes of this data set. But now we can see that the, this, this section in gray, like it updates quite uh, smoothly. 
However, now that I changed the data set, wait, over here, now it's flickering. Uh, and that's because, uh, as it is mentioned over here, the, the, the cause of that flickering is that the update select input, that is the function that is updating these values for the columns that we can choose, uh, it only has an effect after all outputs and observers have run. So okay. in this case, now that we have a look at the, now that we can see the code, you can see uh, we have select the pressure or the carbs data set. Over here, the choices for this select input, there are none. We are going to be updating those. And over here is simply uh, uh, printing the code for the summary function. So the reactive expression that we find is simply retrieving the data uh, after this choice. So data set would be the data of the pressure uh, data set or the car data set. And now as we can see over right here, it says that once a selection of the data set has been made, uh, update the possible choices in the select input that is show which are the attributes of that specific data set. I choose cars and now the, the columns have changed. Uh, and the last part is simply to print the summary of, of such data set uh, with respect to the column I specified. In this case, it could be the data set cars and the column speed. So the, the problem arises that uh, when I change the, the data set, for example, over here it's in cars and column. But if I were to change it to pressure, then the code would run first this when this output update. So it, it's now updating this part, this code over here. And it would be data set. Now it's no longer cars, but it is pressure. But the input column, it is still the previous value. Uh, we have the column speed, I think. So over here, it would be executing summary of the pressure that data set with respect to the column and I think it was a speed. But such attribute is, is not included in pressure, so we get a mistake. However, after that mistake, this update select like input code is executed because it gets executed after reactive expressions on the output. Uh, and now that that the, um, that the attribute is one of the pressure data set, then this uh, becomes something like summary of pressure respect to the column. Let's see, which, which is the first one? Temperature. So now, now it gets updated. So there is a little bit, not of lag, but there is a, an order with respect to when do the input steps get, when do the inputs parameters get updated? So uh, one solution that the user, that the author, author provides is to use this function freeze reactive value. And that makes sure that any reactives or outputs, for example, as we are seeing over here, the reactive or, or this output, the, that, uh, that the, sorry, that these reactive um, outputs use the input. <laughs> now I'm going to read it again, I got lost. Uh, we're going to use the freeze reactive value function function to ensure that any reactives or outputs that use the input uh, won't be updated until the next full round of invalidation. Uh, so that's basically what we can see over here in example six. It's really the same code, but we have this line, freeze reactive value. In this case, we are working with an input because we have this value over here. Uh, and the attributes for that input would be column because we're we are really taking a look at input column. So that's why we have this name equal column. Uh, and, and this, it, it kind of fixes the, the issue, the flickering that we observed. Uh, but I, I really like how it does it. So I, I proposed a, a different solution first. Let's see how it changes when we implement the, uh, the this code, this free reactive value 
function like the author mentions. I choose cars and it flickers a little bit. Uh, it is still flickering. But now if we replace this uh, code for, for getting the summary with this, it's simply the same, but we are isolating the change in the in in which data set we are selecting. I run the app again and now now we uh, see. I think uh, it works. Almost the same react react reaction time. I uh, we are uh, before it worked. I think we're getting the same then. Yeah. Let's see. Um, when we saw the flickering, I, I ran the previous version. Hmm. Uh, well, I don't know, like right now, how to fix it. I, I feel that it didn't work when I was testing it. Okay. okay. Well, there are many more examples. Uh, let's not like get stuck in that part. So it's actually good. It's an opportunity for us to still learn something. And I'm quite I'm, I'm quite excited to see that you use something out of the textbook. It shows that uh, you have a hang over the reactive programming. Thank you. Okay, so for this next section, we are looking at circular references. Um, uh, well, I didn't do the app because it's going to get stuck in an infinite loop, but it turns out that this action that we have been doing of manually, sorry, of updating the parameter of an input, uh, Shiny recognizes that updating as if the user had manually change the input. That is if, if he or she would have clicked on a button or change some text. Uh, so that means that when we do this updating, then Chinese is also going to check if there was some reactive or some output that has that had such input as a, as a dependency and it's going to, to rerun its code. So in this example, uh, we are going to take a look at a possible infinite loop. And it's simply uh, this, uh, this is scenario that we have some numeric input with ID n and initial value zero. And um, we're going to, to make the app so that whenever we change the value in this numeric input, uh, we want to make that shiny. Now changes the value of such input uh, via increasing one to, to that one. So for example, first is zero, then we manually change that input. Now it, it is one, but it, that means that, chi that shiny detects this change. So it will now take the current value, now it's one, and it will update, it will increase by one. So now, it, now it's two. But now that the input has been updated, it's going to detect again the change. So now, is going to perform this updating. So it was two, this value. So it increases one and now it's three. And really it, repeat, it repeats uh, forever or until the machine explodes. Um, well, well, this example is pretty trivial. So it's not like it's going to come up in a, in a specific app, but the author mentions that something like this can happen in a scenario like uh, the one proposed over here in this example, let's see, example seven. Uh, it's simply an app to change temperature uh, from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, in general, it works fine, but he mentions this issue. Uh, we said Fahrenheit to 120, and then, then let's take a look at uh, what happens. First, it gets, it gets converted to Celsius, it's okay. But now as I click in the, down, in the down arrow for Fahrenheit, it changed from 120 to 118. So, like, so, and some event was triggered so that this update 
of the numeric input for Fahrenheit, it would uh, it occurs twice. Uh, I will and, and the author explains why what it happens. It's mainly due to bad approximations, but what he mentions over here of using these multiple sources of truth in your application. Uh, and that is, I mean, I understood uh, these term sources of truth as parameters that we, when you change such parameter, like all, almost, almost all of the variables in your application uh, get transformed via yeah, that new change that you have done. If you have some scenario like that, then yes, the, there is this kind of circular reference that can occur. And in this case, it, it really wasn't such an issue. In, in general, it was fine. Uh, but that is due to, uh, to uh, a certain convergence between the approximations that are occurring in, in this R code when we are changing uh, from Fahrenheit to Celsius using like Yes, uh, computer numbers. So not like the precise mathematical ones, but but being limited to simple approximations of numbers. But yeah, it can occur. And now we take a look at the second method that the author proposes, and that is to generate at the beginning of the of the app all of the of this of the content for the user interface. But what we'll, what we will change is uh, which parts of the user interface we are showing or hiding to the user. So the, the way to do that, well, the way shown to do that is going to, to, to be with the function tab set panel. And um, let's take a look at that in this example, example eight. It's really something that we have seen early on. We have already worked with these tab set panels uh, and tab sets. In this case, uh, it is not like the exact code that we saw early on because I think in chapter eight, we only saw tab panel, not tab panel body. But I, I will explain it a little bit uh, why we are now using this parameter type hidden and why tab panel body. Let's see. So I changed this selected value, and now what it will be displayed to the user, uh, this part on the right is going to be changing as well. Panel two, I select panel three, and then the panel for, so, uh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry, and then the content for panel three is displayed. So all of this content is generated. Uh, as soon as the app begins, we are simply changing what is being displayed right now. Uh, and the way to do that is first we have some select input controller and that is going to determine what to show and what to hide and now what we are going to be updating is this tab set panel input and um, we are using this type equal hidden because if I, if we were to use no not this new function tab panel but no, sorry this new function tab panel body but the one that we saw early on, tab panel, and we don't use this hidden parameter, then, then we get the tabs over here in the upper part. Over here is empty, as you can see, because we are only defining the body for these tab sets, not the, let's call it the, the title, the label. Uh, but if we're using tab panel, but I don't want this over here to show this, this label, then this type equal hidden parameter okay, let's get rid of it. So we, because we are simply defining the content of the tab set and, and not the title, then we can not use tab panel, but only tab panel body to define its actual content. Uh, and as I was saying, the idea of how this select input changes what it's being shown to the user is that with this tab set panel input, as we click on, on one selection, uh, this tab set panel inputs, the selected value, it's going to be updated via the choices we make. And in this case, it works because the choices, that is panel one, panel two, and panel three, they are precisely the same 
as the identifiers for the tab sets that we are using in this tab set panel. So that, that is very important to, to be exact with the choices that you're providing uh, this, uh, this input to determine what to show and what to hide to the user in the user interface, uh, and which are the IDs for those sections of code that you want to show or, or hide. Um, over here, it, it says match choices and the IDs of the tab sets. Now, conditional UI, let's see, we're going to see an example where the value of inputs are independent. Um, well, let's take a look at the app. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was doing. Ah, okay, I remember. Okay, yeah, that that comment makes sense after running the apps. Uh, I should I should have changed uh, that line to it after. So we are simply I going to provide the user three types of distributions: normal, uniform, and exponential. And of course, each of these distributions comes with its own parameters. Uh, for normal, we have the mean and the standard and the standard deviation. But for exponential, we only need one parameter. So what I mean by conditional UI is that depending in some choice, for example, now in which distribution I am choosing, then maybe from the uh, given the choice, show or display some content of the page. In this case, when I choose the normal distribution, then these uh, numeric inputs are going to be shown for me and the standard deviation. But if I choose another distribution, then another numeric input is going to be shown, in this case, the one for the rate. And uh, really number of samples, uh, it doesn't matter. Really. So how we do that is over here. Again, we're, we're working with a subset panel to define what to show, what to hide. And the three scenarios are normal, uniform, and exponential. Um, and due to that, uh, what we will be shown, depending on those cases, will be included in some tab panel. In this case, it will be tab panel. Yeah, I think it could have been tab panel body again. We thought it really didn't quite make a difference thanks, thanks to this parameter, the people here. And um, as we can see, when we choose normal, then these numeric inputs are being shown. When we choose uniform, only these are going to be shown, uh, such and such. And again, the idea, the important part is that uh, it's over here, that the choices that we are providing, the input that determines what to show or what to hide, that is normal, uniform, and exponential, those are exactly the same as the IDs for the sections of the user interface that we are going to be tabling. In this case, ID normal, ID uniform, and ID exponential. They have to match. And it's really the same idea, update what to show. And depending on, on what choice you made, and then it performs some different calculation. And then simply show the histogram of such data. Uh, now for this list, for this last part with our interface, we're going to be using buttons. No, sorry, we're going to be simulating uh, multiple pages inside one. In the previous case, we were simulating multiple sections of a page. Uh, and now with this illusion, we are going to be working with example nine. So let's see. With nine. Ah, sorry. Example ten. Okay. So this would be like the first page. It has its content and, and then the button to go to the next one. Second page, and then again a button, two buttons. Now. 
go to the previous page or to the next one. So now that I go to the next one, we are in the last one now. So now we can simply go back. And I know I, I found this uh, the most useful at least for me and, and the type of apps that I am creating. Uh, and the main idea is really, again, make use of the top set panel function. Uh, make use of the panel to define which sections to show or hide. And over here, we saw the first the, the first page is content was the actual content and the button to change. In this case, it's the identifier says page underscore one, two, because we are moving from page one to page two. When we are being shown page two, we have a button to go from page two to page one or from page two for, to page three. Uh, and this is specific a uh, form of the IDs of these action buttons to navigate which page to go to. It's quite useful uh, in order to perform the switching of the page, sorry, the simulation of the switching of a page. Uh, once we do the updating of the tabs of panel, via this part because uh, now we can see over here for example that when the input for changing from page one to two gets clicked and uh, simply make this change to page two we are retrieving the uh, that would be retrieving this this parameter this number and then simply pasting it to this card to this string we can see right here, page one, page two, page three. So again, one, one, one more example of uh, being careful about the, the definitions that we do, sorry, that we uh, apply for the number, for the identifiers of the sections of the user interface that we're going to be changing to. And, and that's great for this second part. Is it any any questions or comments? For me, no question. Okay, so let's see the last section. And that is uh, the more general one. In this case, we are going to dynamically create different types or number of inputs and outputs. Uh, we are not going to be tagging visibility or updating inputs. We are actually creating new, new content for the page. Uh, we will be doing that via these two functions. Some, fa some function for the user interface, the UI output, and there is a placeholder for the content that we are going to insert into the page. And in the server, we'll be, we will be using the render UI function and we are simply telling uh, Shiny uh, what information to fill this placeholder. Uh, and we can use this function while the app is running. So due to this is why it says that it is, a, it is being dynamically updated. So a couple examples. Let's see, we are going to create an input control with the type and label controlled by two other inputs. So let's see, example 12. We have two inputs, label and type. Um, we are going to be creating one more input. In this case, that is what is being shown over here in the, this slider. So if I change to numeric, this is changing as well. And over here, I can change the label. As you can see, if I were to, to choose some value for these newly created inputs, when I change the type of input, it's going to get lost. For example, now it is for such value. And now that I change, the value is zero. Uh, that will be a problem that we're going to fix in the next example, but how are we creating such input, for example? It's over here. For making, we have our two inputs first, this first two. 
And now we're simply creating this page folder for uh, how to update the page. And in such section of the page, we are going to render some content for the user interface. So depending on what type of choice does the user make, a slider or numeric, then we define this code that we were accustomed to seeing it only in the user interface. Now it can directly go in the server function. We simply set to this new input and the label that we had thanks to this input over here. Uh, and so the problem that I was mentioning, uh, notice this, this first, that when we first load the app, this new slider that we are going to create, a, it takes a while to appear. So I'm going to refresh the page. We can see there's like, I don't know, a, a third of a second that this slider appears after the other inputs have been inserted into the page. Uh, and due to that, if you rely too much on the render UI function, then your user interface can become quite laggy or quite slow. Uh, and also what I mentioned uh, before, that we set some value for this new for this newly created input, but as I change the input, the value is lost because now it's zero. And the solution that the author provides us with uh, is a function that I have been using no, sorry, that I used in the previous example. And that is the, this isolate function. Uh, let's first take a look at how the app works now. It's really the same, but now that I change the value for this new newly created input, and I change the type of input, then the value, it, it would be still for the value fixed. Why? Why doesn't work? It worked over here. That's pretty weird that examples work before class and then in class they don't work. Um, let's see, value, value. Maybe I didn't change the directory. I didn't change so, but uh, let's see. I know, yeah, I think it was. Right. So two, the value is two, but now it changed to a slider. Okay, and it is two again. Yeah, that was the problem. I was in the wrong directory. So the idea was to use this isolate function. Uh, and what it does is that, for example, if I were not to use this line, but this one over here, this, then it would mean that for this render UI context, uh, it happens that if there is a change in the dynamic input, that is in the in the new in the new one that we are creating, that is this one over here. Uh, if there is a change in that, then perform all of this code between these curly braces again. But I, I don't want changes to this input to make the code in, in its uh, in its reactive context to get re-executed. So we remove that dependency via the isolate function. So now if this input uh, changes value, then it, it does not produce any re-execution of this code over here uh, between these blue curly braces. Uh, and we do that because if, if we were not using this, then as I change this value over here, this slider would be being created again and again and again. And it really doesn't have to. Uh, and it, it will probably replace a uh, large interface in the, in the app also. Uh, and I, as I was saying, we're simply retrieving this value via the, uh, assigning it to some variable and then assigning such value to the input that we are creating. It's really changing this part over here and I in this line, the only difference to what we had before. Well, almost the only difference, but uh, it doesn't matter. And uh, this part is multiple controls. Uh, and there is like 
Okay. Not an automatization, but a generalization of what we have been doing to create multi or to create inputs. And uh, we are creating them like manually. That is in the same sense that we have been seeing uh, in, in the last meetings. But now we're going to create them dynamically. So, it's, so yeah, it's like an, a kind of automatization. Uh, and to do that, where we taking, where we working with these functions from the Perl library? That is map. Uh, also map character uh, reduce. I, I will not explain what they do right now. Uh, I will I will comment on that as we use them. So in this case, we are going to let the user supply their own color palette. Let's see. Example 14. We'll be using the Perl library. Um, now let's run the Sometimes it's better to look at the code first and then the app. But I, I feel like I need to run it to remember what it does. Okay, so. I'll, I'll be changing this first input, the number of colors, and depending on, on that number, uh, we will be taking, sorry, we will be creating this specific number of uh, numeric inputs. As we can see over, over, over here, it's five for the number of colors. So five numeric inputs have been created. If I put two, then only two. And um, as I, uh, sorry, they are, they are text inputs. And as I type some uh, text into them, then simply a text type into them is going to be displayed over here in this new part. But, but the interesting uh, action that this app is doing is really this, uh, uh, this creation of new inputs depending on this number. Because, it, because it's not like if we had copy pasted the code for uh, create a text input depending on the number like like if we have done something like like this depending on the number of of colors that we want so how we how do we avoid such copy pasting let's see this is the app and uh, we're providing the number of colors and we are defi defining some section of the page to update um, in the last part, we're simply showing uh, which colors we chose this, this text. Uh, sorry, I thought that I have a color. Okay. So in the server function, let's see. Uh, we're going to define this call names variable. It's simply going to paste call with a sequence of length this number. So for example, if input n is two, then the, the this part over here would be the vector one and two. So over here, we're simply pasting, say, I want to choose two for a number of colors, then call names would be call one, well, as a string, well, it's a vector name over here uh, as a string, and then call two, this person. This would be the value of all names because those will be the identifiers because now that we are using the render UI function uh, and the map function from the Perl library, uh, we are performing this. We are taking as input the, the values in call, in call names in this reactive expression. Uh, in, in the example that I was giving, the value would be the, this, call underscore one and call underscore two. And then we're executing this code. We're creating ah, this symbol simply, in, in this case, this symbol is simply uh, performing that when we see this over here, dot x, that means replace uh, the value from this vector into this specific part. So we're, we're imagining this, right? That call names is a call one and call two. So what is happening over here is we're 
executing this this code, but with these values, that x being replaced by call one and call two. So it's really doing something like text input, replace that x with the values. So call one as its identifier, and then null as the value of such, sorry, I think label of that text input. And then because call names have two has two values, call one, call two, it per, it perform performs it again. And now with the second value, replacing the dot x symbol, and then again will. So this is what it's getting executed in this line. If we assume this this example for call names. Okay, I, I hope that, that was clear. And then in this render text, that is this part over here. And there was a comment. No, nothing. I, I, I think it has to go. Okay, well, I will continue for the recording. And now in this render text part, this map character functions, uh, function, uh, it simply creates a, a vector of strings via these inputs, sorry, via these values. Um, applying this function. In this case, let's take a look at the example that we had established. If call names well, equals the values call one and call two, that is the same as I have over here. Then execute for the values in this, that is for call one and call two. This over here is going to say to check. Uh, if this value is null, then this would be the output, simply a, an empty string. But if it is not null, the value, then that would be the output. So now that we apply map character with these specific values for call names, then what would be executed would be input with call one. Uh, assuming it's not null because over here it's not because this value is actually red. Uh, and then the same for the second value of call name. So it would be input call two. Assuming it's not null. Over here it's blue. But if it will if it would be like this, it would be null. So uh, this line would actually be this as we can see over here because it's red followed by, by an empty string. So this would be the result of this function, assuming this uh, and this sort of values for the text input, the value of red and the null value. Ah, and we're using uh, double braces for input, uh, only because we need it over here, because we, we can't write something like input dollar dot x. Uh, er, R will not reconnect, recognize it. Uh, but really, this line over here is it's really the same as input call one. Uh, as we have been using. Okay. Uh, and I really hope that I was clear. We don't have much time. Uh, let's see. Uh, now, some new example, uh, when well, fixed information loss, uh, I don't remember when we lost, ah, over here. So if I set some number of colors and then provide which color I want, if I change the number of color, then we lost such previous information, but really an example is uh, mostly changing uh, what we saw in the previous case that you're retrieving the actual information. And then when you redefine your, your input, simply pass along that information and using the isolate function. So that this uh, execution of creating inputs doesn't get executed every time that you're changing the actual values for the inputs. That is every time that you are writing which color that you want. Uh, and that is, which example is it? 15. Let, let's see.
So I find two colors. Uh, let's see, red, blue. But now as I change the colors, I, uh, we are not using information. I think it's simply because of, because, um, where is it? There has to be some isolate over here. Uh, it, it, it was being highlighted. This, now we are isolating these changes in which color do, do we want? If I had put like this, then every time that I am writing a song number, sorry, some, some possible color, then the whole, this whole inputs are, get, are getting recreated. So that's quite uh, consuming and unnecessary. We only need to create them when this value changes. Uh, so you saw right that as I was changing this, uh, there was even quite a bit of lag. Uh, I had like one over here and I was seeing four inputs. So yeah, uh, one more reason to not use uh, render UI if you are if you are creating uh, a lot of content. Uh, then the almost last part is about dynamic filtering. Let's see. Ah. There are a couple of, exam of examples in the book, uh, but I am going to only uh, see the, the last one that he shows, and that is the more general one. And um, what it does is to filter, well, not any data frame, filter from a specific list of data frames, and then use a slider for, sorry, create a slider for its numeric variables uh, and multi-select inputs for its categorical variables. So let's see how does the author manage to do that. This application. Now over here, it would be useful to take a look first at the code, at parts of the code. We have been working with these package datasets and using functions like get and ls. And uh, really the idea is that we are working with these types of data sets that are provided us with. For example, let's see, this uh, Iris data set that many of us have seen, these empty cards. Uh, and what the author is doing over here is, uh, fr from this whole list of data sets, we're only going to select those of them that have a data frame type of a structure. Because some of them, uh, are actually time series. So, I mean, they are not data frames. So for this app, we only get, we only retrieve the data frames from such list. So those, those will be our possible options. Uh, and what we do later on with such data sets is the following. I'm running the app now. So we select one of, the, of those data frames. Let's see, let's select Iris. Um, only from, from, such, from such selection, these um, sliders are getting created for the numeric variables of the iris dataset. And this multi-select input is getting created for the categorical variables of this selected dataset. Uh, and then we're simply uh, taking a look at, uh, at the first six, I think 10 rows of the selected dataset, but uh, sorry, of the of the data set after being filtered via these conditions. For example, I can filter sepal length has to be in this range, sepal width over here, and perhaps I only want Virginica as a species. Uh, I don't know why it's not working Virginica. Okay, that was Virginica. Uh, perhaps there isn't so. I, perhaps I'm filtering too much. Okay, there is one Virginica, so this should work. Okay, it didn't work, I don't know. But really, that's the main idea. Only from the selection of the data set, you automatize uh, the creation of the sliders for numeric variables and, uh, and multi-selection for categorical ones. Uh, and the interesting part is over here. 
And let's see how we see the function. If we have these two functions that he defines, we take uh, the actual data and then the name of the of such con sorry, the I think it's the, the value, the values in some column of the data set, and then the name of the column in the data set. So if those values are numeric, uh, we retrieve its minimum and maximum and, and create a slider input, as we can see over here, for time. But if if uh, such values correspond to a factor, then uh, we factorize it and use it with a select input, as we can see over here with set. Uh, if not, uh, well, we don't do nothing because I don't know something going wrong. That is for updating the user interface, as we can see over here to the left. But now to the right, now to actually filter the data that we have selected in this case, and let's pick iris. To actually filter the data in iris, we will be using this function. Again, it takes some, uh, the actual value in the columns. And then I think, uh, wait, let me check. What was what was filter bar used? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Over here, for the first argument is the the actual values for the selected column X in the data frame. That is like only take a look at such column, and then over here, while it's really the values of the input that we that we have specified. With, with one of these. Let's take a look at how it works to make it all make sense. So, uh, no, it's 201. Is it okay if I go on? We only have to, it really, that's really the, the last example. The, this last part, uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't, I didn't really understood it, I think. Uh, I will mention it now. In this last part, dialog boxes, from what I understood is that when we were using this model dialog boxes, as we can see, uh, let's see. Uh, wait, let me change this. Then we run shiny or in this. Um, okay, these were the, the dialog boxes that I was mentioning. No, come on. Okay, it worked. These were the boxes. Uh, we, we click something and then this box appears. And uh, from what I understood is that, where is it? Right here. That this model dialog, that is when we define the content of the box that we are displaying, and uh, they also kind of work like the render UI function because you can insert into them uh, inputs or really content for the page. And after all, we're going to be using this model dialog, that is these, these boxes uh, in the server, as we can see over here. This, this model dialog, we call it model confirm. And um, such a variable, it's being used in the server. So, so from what I understood is that an alternative to UI output and render UI is sometimes to, you, to, to, do, to do this in order to update the user uh, with some information. But now, to finish the, the other example that we are, this one over here, let's, let's finish it. It's really not that complicated. Over here, we load, and uh, sorry, we retrieve only the, uh, the data sets from, from R that are data frames, those that are from, from this list over here. And okay, from this, only the R data sets that are data frames. And then we create this select input to make a choice of which of those data frames we want to choose. Then this will be the part where we create these sliders or multi selections. And then to the right, we're simply going to show a table of the filtered data uh, via these inputs. So in the in the server, it's an interesting part. 
the, uh, this one we have seen before. It's simply from this selection, for example, I chose iris, no CO2. I choose CO2, then data, uh, the value of this reactive expression is the actual content of this data set CO2. So it's a structure values. Then bars is going to be the names of the columns in that data frame in that we have selected. And then for this part of the user interface that we're going to be updating, we are going to perform this uh, calculation. And let's see, for every column of the selected data set, we apply this function. We, and as we saw really, we take a look at the values in such column. And as I mentioned, if they are numeric, uh, create uh, an appropriate slider. If they are not, if they are a factor, uh, create an appropriate select input. If not, do nothing. And we do that with the data over here, the actual values in that column, and then using the column name. And in this part selected, uh, we are going to get the actual filtered data uh, that we are uh, uh, that we are accessing via this uh, filtering via this manual filtering via sliders and and input selections. I think this isn't working. These input selections, no, no. So okay, so how do we filter that data? It's really the same as doing this. Uh, I had an example. This one over here. We have the cars data set. It's only two columns, speed and distance. So let's really see a um, specific case of that. Only the first six rows. Let, let me expand this over here. Okay, so what is the, F, the first rows? And if I want to retrieve uh, uh, rows from this data frame, we can do something like uh, this notation, providing some vectors, uh, sorry, some vector of Boolean values. And um, if it is true, it, will, it would mean then yes, retrieve that row. But if it is false, it means skip that row. So don't retrieve it. So say I only want the first, the third, sorry, the first and the and the second one, only these two first, uh, only first and second row of this data frame DF, then we will have to pass along this Boolean vector, true, true. Uh, retrieve first and second rows, but then we don't want the other rows, so false for the other values. And, and such and such, uh, until we get all of the rows. In this case, there are six rows. So there will be true, true, false, false, false. There should be six elements in this Boolean vector. So it should be, ah, so it is ready. And now we have retrieved them. So really what the author is doing in this part, this map to the bars, uh, bars was the names of the columns of the, of the data frame selected. What he's doing is, uh, for each of those columns, uh, take a look at if uh, the values in those in that columns uh, coincides with what the user is uh, defining as his filtering criteria with these inputs. If there is a match uh, between the filtering that the user has performed uh, and the columns of the data set, then return true. If not, return false. So over here, we're really, uh, with this part over here, what we're really doing is creating a vector of true if the filtering uh, of the data, sorry, it is a row past the filtering that we had established via these inputs. If it didn't pass that uh, filtering, then we get false. And we do that for all of the rows in the in the data, in the selected data set. So in the end, the output of selected it would be something like this vector that I had defined, this true, true, false, false, false. 
And we can see that because over here, the value of this reactive expression, this selected reactive expression, uh, is being used as I, as I did over here. This vector comma uh, between these two between these two brackets to retrieve, sorry, to, to filter which rows you don't want and which rows you don't want. And that's really the main idea. Uh, and that's it really. Uh, so thanks for listening. Um, if there are any questions, maybe. Thank you, Lucio. Um, I don't think I have any questions. Uh, okay, I think the facilitator left. So, and that would be, I'll see you next week. Please. Bye. All right. Have a good, have a good one. See you next week. See you.